fair enough. Um, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is, you know, like I said, cyber forensics and everyday business or an everyday operations. Because unfortunately, a lot of people don't think about the forensic elements of cybersecurity until it's too late, until something's already happened. And then by the time that you do think about it and start looking into it, valuable information has already been lost. A little bit about me and, uh, and why I'm discussing this particular topic. Uh, as was said, I am a, a security analyst with OmniSoc. I started with OmniSoc in May. So much like Michael, I am uh, very much a new guy and still trying to figure out what I'm doing and who all I'm working with. Uh, but I do look forward to meeting even more of you as time goes on. Um, I got my master's in cybersecurity with specializations in forensics and intelligence uh, from Utica College in 2018. Um, most of my background prior to that, I did a lot of work in help desks. So I've seen so many things that uh, very few things can surprise me anymore. Um, my security experience is highly in DOD contracting space and a little bit in the medical industry, but I'm actually much, much happier now working in academia. When it comes to cybersecurity and forensics, you should always hope for the best, but expect the worst. Assume that something will happen. Um, I've checked some reports and as of September, they were estimating that approximately 2,200 cyber attacks happen per day in the US. That's approximately one every 39 seconds. That's over 800,000 per year. That's a lot. So if your group hasn't been hit, it's probably just a matter of time and you've been lucky. Um, there's nothing wrong with being lucky, but safe is better. So what do you do about this? Well, you decide to be ready and you, uh, you, you take a proactive stance. If you assume that something is going to happen and you put measures in place for when it does, then when it does, you're ready, you can get the information that you need, get everything fixed as quickly as possible. Part of that includes practicing and revising. Just because something is state of the art, top of the line and perfectly effective now, doesn't mean that it's going to be a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. So you need to stay on top of it. It's not a set it and forget it kind of thing. It's something that you have to monitor, that you have to revise and you have to practice. It's a reason why we do tabletop exercises with OmniSoc uh, with some of our members. And it's, it's why the, the companies that are the most prepared are the ones who end up coming through faster and in better shape. Maintain a paper trail. Document, document, document. I know you've probably heard that uh, preached in the IT field forever, um, probably in research as well. Um, it's especially important here because if you don't have it written down somewhere, then you might as well assume you don't have it. Um, if you document it, then you know where it is, you know what it does, you know how it works, and you know what to do with it. So make sure that you maintain your documentation and make sure that someone knows how to find it. Um, having a cyber attack hit, a ransomware attack hit, and then trying to figure out where are the backups stored after the fact is just a recipe for disaster. Safe storage is another factor. You wanna make sure that the important paperwork, the documentation, your recovery plans, your playbooks, you wanna make sure that these are kept somewhere safe where the people who need access to them can get it, but where the people who don't need access to it can't. Um, this becomes you know, especially important in the event of insider threats you know, where it's someone within your own organization that's trying to steal the research or trying to destroy the research or trying to damage something, you want to make sure that they can't get to the stuff that's going to help you recover and get you know, back the stuff that you need. But you want to make sure that, you know, your IT people, your IT security people, your leadership people who need access to this information and this data can find it easily and quickly. Evidence integrity is critical especially if an attack ends up you know, having to go and involve law enforcement. You want to make sure that everything is kept safe and secure. The reason for that, for the, like the chain of custody, you wanna make sure that you can prove that the data hasn't been manipulated on your end. 
So you have things like hash files, um, you know, hash values that you can use and show over and over, this has not been modified from its original state. Um, offloading logs is something that I, I, I'm sure, I'm hoping, at least um, a lot of you are familiar with. But a lot of attacks, if a, if a hacker gets into your network, one of the first things that they're going to try to do is cover their tracks. They're going to delete the log files. They're going to eliminate proof or evidence that they were there because that way they can hide. One rule of criminals, they don't want to get caught. You know, they want to steal stuff and not get caught for it. So they cover their tracks. You know, they eliminate the paper trail. They eliminate the evidence. If you're offloading your logs to a separate you know, place on your network, they aren't necessarily going to even know that you're doing that. They may think that they've covered their track, but you still have a backup of everything that's happened, you know, of all the, the steps that they took and everything that they've done that you can then present to management, to law enforcement, to whoever, to, uh, to help remediate the issue. Client agents for data collection. There's some really good forensic software out there. Uh, the two biggest retailers are um, Incase and FTK. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of FTK because um, they have a smaller free version of their software that lets you play around. Um, but both of these can put agents onto your systems that don't take up a lot of space. They don't take up bandwidth. They just sit there. You know, they're not collecting things on an ongoing basis, but they're present for when they're needed. What this means is, for example, uh, Michael was talking about you know, the academic research fleet. If there's a ship doing you know, research in the Arctic Ocean, you can't really go on site if an incident happens. You need to be able to access the system remotely. That's what these client agents will allow you to do. You can then remotely connect to the system be, you know, as soon as an incident's reported. You know, for example, in the case of a, of a research vessel, they suspect that someone is trying to exfiltrate data from this system. Well, if there's a client agent on that system, we can remote in, take an image capture, including the volatile memory, you know, the things that go away as soon as the system gets powered down, and be able to see what exactly is being done, you know, things that we would lose well before we could you know, get something installed onto it without that person knowing what's happening. So there's, there are steps that you can take like that uh, that will put you in a better position for if and when something does happen. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. The important thing to take away from this is you need to ask yourself if you have a plan in place. Like I said, assume that something is going to happen. 800,000 attacks per year means that surely someone in this room is going to experience a cyber attack of some kind, whether it's ransomware, whether it's phishing uh, attacks, whether it's a hacker breaking into your system, you know, whatever it may be, you're going to experience them. So you need to make sure you know, that you do have a plan. Make sure it's part of your everyday security. Make sure that it's included in your incident response plans. You should definitely have incident response plans, much like you would have the disaster recovery plans, just as part of your everyday IT practices anyway. If you bake this stuff in from the beginning, then you don't have to worry about it later. You just have to maintain. And it's always easier to maintain and upgrade as you go than it is to try and implement a new solution in the middle of what's already you know, putting everyone on edge because of the level of, uh, of disaster or attack. And I know it uh, hasn't been that long, but you um, can go ahead and move to questions because personally, I am a big fan of ice cream. Um, cloud storage can be good. The problem, the only problem with cloud storage is you have to determine where the risk lies or who's, <coughs> excuse me, who's accepting it. 
um, that needs to be a part of the initial contract with that cloud sto cloud storage um, organization. If you're using you know Google Drive, you need to know if something happens, is Google assuming that risk and going to you know to pay for it, or is that going to fall back on your organization? Um, make sure that that information is determined and find out what their security is. If they can't answer that question, don't use it. What do yeah. you have in your forensics plan? Sorry? What do you have in your forensics plan? What do I have in my forensics plan? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> on my home system, I have some softwares installed and, uh, you know, so that I can re, you know, reclaim any lost data or anything that I accidentally delete. Um, and I can utilize that for anyone on my network, uh, which it would include family. Um, as far as from an organizational standpoint with OmniSoc, um, I honestly am not sure because that goes way beyond my, uh, my pay grade. Um, at the very least, I would recommend getting some agent software, getting even if you contract it out, you know, which is something that uh, OmniSoc is hoping to be able to potentially offer down the road um, as a service. Even if you're contracting it out, make sure that you have something in place. Um, make sure it's part of your playbook you know, and that the right people know about it and know what to do with it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm assuming on on the log side of the logging side of the house, I think I forgot what term you used for offloading I'm log. Offloading logs, I think was the mm -hmm. point. I'm assuming that's something that's sysloggy, uh, or that's maybe one solution for doing that. That is uh, one solution. It, and I would syslogging. expect that. Is that a common solution? Um, depends on the organization. Okay. I know so my, from my DOD experience, um, some of the programs that I worked on did syslogging. Um, others we're still too early in their development to uh, okay. to really have to worry about that. So if I was an attacker, that seems like a common thing I would look for is our logs being offloaded. Can I attack that? And, uh, or, and, and, or are there better, more secure chain of custody ways of logging logs? You can also limit the risk on that with um, who has permissions and access to you know, the syslog files. You know, so you're transitioning it from point A to point B more people have access to point A, fewer have access to point B. So if an attacker gets in, they're going to have to not just access the system and the network, they're going to have to escalate into one of those accounts. And if they're separate accounts from the person's normal account, they're gonna to have to go even further. And by the time they've done that, they're making so much noise that something should have alerted that they're there. Uh, yes, yeah, so you've been primarily focused on cyber incidents. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in uh, areas like automotive, uh, um, aviation, uh, and natural gas distribution, where they've been primarily focused on just um, accidents uh, mm -hmm. and you know other types of natural uh, events. And they've started, as cyber's become a more integral part, they've started thinking about uh, cyber incidents. And one of the challenges is sort of differentiating uh, between the two, because the way uh, they've traditionally, you know, collected information and done forensics analysis mm -hmm. is different than what you need for cyber. So I'm just curious for your thoughts if you've run into sort of this this challenge of being able to, you know, differentiate between the two and make sure you've collected enough evidence to determine if something's just uh, anomalous or or is a adversarial attack. My personal opinion on that is that you shouldn't put them in separate camps. Um, you should have them working closely together and highly involved in what you know, both sides are doing, whether it's, you know, physical forensics, physical security compared to cyber forensics, cyber security. You know, it all falls under the security umbrella and it should both groups should be working together to make sure that the solutions are in place, because even if you have one, there's likely elements of the other involved. Yeah, if someone's trying to break into a physical facility, they're probably going to have a cyber element involved in that you know, because of alarms, cameras, you know, whatever other you know, aspects of physical security have that, uh, that online or uh, intranet connection. Yeah, and vice versa, if you're trying to access uh, 
through it you know, through a cyber attack it's a lot easier to come in from the inside than it is to go through a firewall you know so having the two teams working together is definitely going to be a better way to protect than trying to isolate them into their own little you know, their own little zone Hi. Um, my undergrad was in digital or my undergrad was in IT with a focus in digital forensics. Mm -hmm. And we really focused on using the command line tools, uh, mostly DD, just a lot of that. We never really got into um, commercial tools. Mm -hmm. Is there any, and I know you hit on in case um, as well, um, an FTK imager. Um, but is there anything that you would say start with for forensic response tool wise that would be like a good go-to to just really get a good grasp on forensic response? Um, yeah, definitely. There's um it's kind of a considered obsolete uh, piece of software, but it's still functional for a lot of basic things, which is uh, Pro Discover. Um, it's you can get copies of it for free. Um, you can use it for image captures. I actually used it once because I deleted something off of a thumb drive, and I needed it back. Uh, so I was able to take a forensic image of the thumb drive, find the deleted file, reopen it, resave it. Um, so highly recommend that one. If you're looking for something more command line or more Linux oriented, uh, volatility is a really good one. Uh, that's one that we used a lot in a couple of the classes that I took in, in my grad program. Um, Reg Ripper is another fun one to play with. Um, just play around in the registry of a system and, and see what's there and what's going on. Um, so from a basic standpoint, I would recommend those as well as FTK Imager Lite which is the free version. Um, that'll let you do some data carving and see files broken down into hexadecimal format. Um, that's one of my favorite parts of forensics is, you know, you break it down into hexadecimal format, you look for the magic numbers to see what kind of file it really is, try saving it as a different file type and then play with it. Um, to me, that's fun, but I'm not a normal person. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on autopsy? The software package for um, uh... that's not one that I've used. Oh, okay. so I don't really have much of an opinion on it. Okay. Um, but it's something that I will certainly look into. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? mentioned some agents that can give you remote access to devices um, and I wonder what do they offer on top of say just SSH server that so you can SSH um, the device. In case and FTK both offer agents that can be installed on um, on client systems and a big thing that they offer is in, well, yeah the being able to SSH into them but being able to do that image capture remotely um, as opposed to having to go to the physical device and plug in. Um, the big advantage there is the volatile memory. Um, things that are stored in RAM go away when you reboot. And if someone suspects that you're, you know, onto them, the first thing they're going to do is reboot or wipe or try to wipe the drive. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to grab that image capture remotely before they even know that you are aware of them um, greatly increases your ability likelihood of finding out what they're doing, how they're doing it, uh, if they're exfiltrating data, where they're sending it, how they're doing it, you know, all the important information mm -hmm. that you're going to want to get. Thanks. So that partic particular topic that you brought up is one that's been of concern at our university, because as endpoint agents are being deployed, more broadly throughout the university, particularly within the research environment, there are concerns about privacy, um, especially for research projects that could be working for information that is not just, say, like tied to IRBs, but could expose individuals and research participants that are at risk. Um, so, and this is a general concern. So is there anything that you've seen or dealt with that helps us to allow the collection of that type of detailed information within a SOC or other secure environment that the there is a trust there that uh, what's being provided is not uh, going to expose us to other risks or liabilities. 
Um, that's where you know, things like in case and FTK come in handy because they don't broadcast until you tell them to. Uh, so they're just sitting there you know, taking up minimal space, not you know, taking up bandwidth. There's agents out there that definitely do what you're talking about. Things like Tanium, for example, uh, works as a packet sniffer that gets installed on systems. Um, during my help desk days, I worked in a uh, worked for a pharmaceutical company, and because of the, some of the research, I mean, there were things that were very proprietary to see a specific clients, and we had to at one point because the company got bought, um, and the parent company wanted Tanium on every system, and we had to you know push back and say it can't be on certain lab systems because of proprietary data we can't have it capturing that information on an ongoing basis. Um, but things like, you know, the forensic agents don't broadcast, they don't, you know, without being specifically told to, you know, they're not recording that information on an ongoing basis until it's needed um, by design. You know, so you have the, you know, for what it's worth, I mean, you have the word of the company that creates the agent, um, but in the case of FTK and in case you're talking about companies that have a, a sterling reputation in you know, the court system and in law enforcement for what they do and don't do. You know, they've been used in literally millions of court cases, you know, all over the world. So, yeah, from that perspective, you've got about as much trust as you're going to get. So the way that I'll say this is I'm thinking out loud about how I would deal with the university mm -hmm. is um, in the same way that the university has keys to your office, uh, and they will go in only in times of need. Mm -hmm. Those e agents can be present, and then in times of need, uh, they could be used for forensics. Right. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Thank you.